Welcome to the Wolf Brothers Podcast. My name is Daryl. My name is Cormac. Together, we set up this podcast to chat to other men about their journeys through life. The high moments, the low moments, and what helped them push past the obstacles that life threw at them. In this first episode, we get to chat to Ian Taylor about his journey and what led him to helping other people climb the world's highest mountains. We hope you enjoy this first episode of the Wolf Brothers podcast. Ian Taylor, thanks very much for coming on and talking to me, myself and Cormac here today. And we really appreciate that you're taking the time to do it. And there's one thing that myself and Cormac have been asking each other since we since we've um, noticed what you do and stuff with your trekking and that, and that's what drives a man to want to climb the highest mountains in the world? Um, What drives me? I mean, I, I think I spent most of my teenage years into my 20s not really knowing what the hell I was doing. Uh, drifted through college, got, you know, C's and wasn't very good at very much. Um, and I think I was, my dad exposed me to the outdoors and he was from Wicklow, a um, little town called Animo. I think it's probably one of the only towns in Ireland that doesn't have a pub. Um, so we had to go fishing or go to Glendalock or go out hiking. And I'll never forget looking up um, from the, the, uh, the big lake down towards the back end of Glendalock and looking over those hills going, I wonder what's over there. And you kind of like, uh, I never really, you know, thought I could get up there because I was like that's massive as a kid you're like that's way too big so I, I never went up there and then years later in my teenagers I went up and I was like oh we can do this and hung out in some of those uh, little ponds and uh, pools up on the on the way up to on the on a hike called the Spink around uh, Glendalock and I think from there I mean I, I was I was in the Cubs I was in the Scouts we did cycles around Wicklow when we were 15 years old we were doing like 100 mile cycles uh, getting kicked out of hostels and at two o'clock in the morning for making too much noise um, and doing all sorts of stuff and you kind of like I kind of it kind of builds from there like I met good people um, I met a friend of mine when I was like that went to Everest with me when we were like nine years old from um, he was from Dean's Grange and we just kind of like you kind of get into a group of people that were doing kind of cool things and we were out biking, like my, I remember my parents going, okay, if you can come up with half the money, we'll get you a K3, I think it was, mountain bike. Um, and I mean, mountain bikes have moved on since then. But we were just like adventurous. And I think when you have that, that was what I liked to do. And I went to, I remember deciding in university because I was not very good um, at what I was doing. I was like, all right, I'm going to go off and travel for a year. And I saved up all my money. I went to London for the first summer. And then went to the States actually for three summers, started working, raising money. And then I was like, I'm going to go off and travel around the world. And when I went around the world, I kind of started hiking and doing mountains and um, getting a little bit more adventurous. Um, and that's how it kind of evolved. I mean, it evolved from just wanting to do something um, unique. I think the Everest thing came from more the fact that I wasn't, particularly good at anything or I was told a lot of the time during my life whether it was teachers or people you know you're not good enough um, you're never gonna you know if you can't do this or you can't get a, a good grade in this you're never you know you're never gonna get ahead and that's not true I mean teachers uh, now that I look back in some of the teachers that I went to school with them or taught me I'm like holy crap these people are not role models or they shouldn't be giving any sort of advice to anybody so I think you you evolve over time in your own ability but Everest for me was about proving to myself that I was good enough and I needed something I was kind of going through my 20s going what am I doing like what am I I want to make a difference I want to make a difference to myself I want to be better and that's Everest just kind of happened to come along at the right time um, in 2005 and went on this kind of journey to see if we could actually do it we, even when we started we're like we have no idea what we're doing um, although we had a background and stuff in climbing and I was climbing since I was a kid, but we didn't have any high altitude experience, no idea of anything. <laughs> so we're kind of like stepping into this world of not knowing what you can and cannot do. And um, now looking back as, you know, as a 42 year old, I'm like, you know, we can, we can pretty much do what we want to do. We just have to get out there and believe in ourselves enough 
and then surround ourselves with the right people. And, and that's kind of what we did. And that has kind of then directed the, the next kind of, you know, 12 years of my life. So it's, it, it was, and then now, I mean, doing all these mountains, you just kind of, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I've done Kilimanjaro 37 times or Island Peak, which is like 20,000 feet, like 17 times or Everest or 8,000 meter peaks or big mountains. You, we just, I love seeing people push themselves to that place where they're, where it's life-changing. And for me, that's what it was. I went to the Himalayas, I went to Kilimanjaro and when I was in my twenties and those experiences just changed me uh, and showed me, humbled me a little bit, but also, you know, it was a learning experience and really life-changing. So I wanted other people to experience that. Um, and that's kind of how the trekking business and, and what we do now has kind of evolved from that. That's um, really interesting for me, Ian, because I suppose my story was kind of similar in a way in terms of I had to leave Ireland and travel for a couple of years to kind of discover what I wanted to do. I worked in IT straight out of college for a couple of years and then I was like, this isn't what I want to do. This isn't my purpose. I want to help people in some way. And so I went traveling and I think it's so important for young people to realize that they need to do that inner discovery and maybe that inner journey as well. And I think that sounds like what that's what you went on with doing your travel and then doing the hikes. And I suppose the question I wanted to ask you was, what was it that you discovered? You said that you, you felt you weren't really necessarily good at anything. What did you discover about yourself yeah. on those hikes in those moments where you're, it was just you and your mind going up the mountain, especially the difficult moments? Did, that teach anything about yourself or did you find any certain peace in those moments or what did you learn mostly from that? Yeah, I mean, you know, on the side of Everest, uh, you know, at 27, 28, 29,000 feet, uh, I was under real pressure because I had never been above those, at those heights before. And, you know, like the three Irish people that had been up there before me had all nearly died. Um, mm. There was a, a friend of mine, a Scottish climber who was on the ridge who went blind from lack of oxygen and almost pulled us off the mountain on this notorious place called a knife edge ridge, which was like a 10,000 foot drop on 8,000 foot drop on another side. Two guys walked past us and we never saw them again. Um, you, you know, my friend Graham, who I knew since I was a kid, um, you know, cracked two ribs from coughing so much that he, he started seeing double and had to turn around. So you, all these things, when they happen, um, you can either crack. And I mean, I almost did because I broke into tears many times on that summit night climb, scared for if I went up here, if I went further, am I going to go blind? Am I going to be like, you know, there's bodies that you sit down beside on the mountain um, and you kind of, you know, think about what happened to them or why did they you know why weren't they good enough or what was the problem and, and all of these dis those are all just distractions from the reality of focusing on what what i need to do and that was the biggest learning that i got from you know standing on the top of everest or making my way through those that kind of you know dangerous place um was that i need to be focused on what i'm doing because what i'm doing <laughs> Is, is what I can control. I can't control anything else. I can't control the weather. I can't control the elements around me, but I can control what I'm going to do. And I'm going to focus on, and this is more of a mountaineering thing, but just focus on breathing, like breathing techniques, movement, controlling my heart rate, because at rest, your heart rate's like 120. Um, so when you're exercising for, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot higher than that. So trying to manage my emotion um manage what i can control is was what i took away from it um and when i came back down then that was a release of kind of or it was kind of an affirmation of um all of like th that type of experience like you know that was the learning that was like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna apply this now to the rest of everything that i do because you know what i'm good enough and that's what i realized that i wasn't like people telling me i'm not good enough I came down and I was like, no, I can do this. I trained hard, I prepared well, 
you know, I had a resting heart rate at 38. I was training eight hours a day in the Wicklow Mountains, two days, then I'd be back in the gym for like three hours the next day. I had done all that work, so I knew I could do it. And that was kind of the learning uh, to be more humble, more, uh, I suppose, take the ego out of it, because uh, we went in with a lot of ego. Take the ego out of it. Uh, focus on what you can control. And that's like, there's so much noise out there right now. Uh, and there always is noise around us. And it's trying to just be quiet, listen to yourself, focus on what you want to do and go and do it. And that's, to me, was the, well, even what we do now and everything that we do, block out everything else, hone in on what you're good at. And then when you're not good at stuff, find people that are good at it. <laughs> uh, if I'm not good at doing stuff, I mean, why, why try? I mean, I'll get bringing people that can do it better than I can ever do it. Um, so I think, yeah, you can't do everything. You have to focus on on what you can control. And that's probably the biggest learning. Yeah, it's it's great listening to you here. Like everything you're saying, it's it's kind of what we are trying to, it's like an analogy for what we are trying to teach to young people. It's like, it's your own journey. Like it's your own mountain. You have to find your way up. Like there's going to be obstacles in the way, like as in the weather, whatever it is, the conditions, but you need to focus, be determined and um, stick to your routine to get to the top of your mountain. Like, you know, and that's kind of what we try to teach people, obviously just with life in general. And I'm kind of, I'm very curious as to which your trekking company and that what type, like, is there, is it all different types of people that come to you wanting to say climb Kilimanjaro or climb Everest or, like, is it from all, say, walks of life, or do you notice a pattern of people that want to push themselves to these kind of, how would you like say, extraordinary kind of feats, like saying, I want to climb Everest? Do they, do they seem to have things they want to also push through? Or? It's a good question. I mean, in reality, we deal with people from everywhere, from Singapore, Australia, the UK, all over the States, all over the world, with people joining our trips. I mean, it's interesting. There's two, there's, we have everybody. I mean, we've people that just want to step out um, and challenge themselves. There's probably a, a small percentage of people that maybe 30%, which isn't that small, but that want to get to somewhere like Kilimanjaro or ever space camp and take a picture and put on Instagram. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so they can one up on, so they can one up on their friends, but most people, <laughs> even if they're doing that, there's still something in them that wants to, is wants to see what they're capable of. Yeah. And I would say we deal with a mixture of people, people that are like stepping out of their own worlds of, um, like I was speaking to a lady yesterday and she's like, yeah, I'm just bored of my life. You know, and this, I saw your inspiring video on Kilimanjaro, I was like, I wanna go. And she signed up yesterday and sent in the paperwork and boom, she's going. Um, so that, if we can, like in my job is to encourage her and get her to a place where she's ready to go and have that experience that she thinks she's gonna have um but yeah we i mean i i dealing with people all over the world now that want to climb everest maybe about 25 people guy from pittsburgh who's a millionaire um people from england from florida that just have like maybe been su successful in in their careers and they realize well that's a waste of time and they want to like pursue more personal uh, achievements um so you meet, really meet everyone but most people the trend is they want to step out of their, their comfort zone. Um, and I mean, that's really where you start living anyway, is when you step out and do stuff that you're not comfortable with. I would say most people, that's what they're searching for. Um, and I think when they do get it, I mean, most people are, like it's incredible watching people there. They come away and they come back and apply themselves to all, all sorts of projects. I'm dealing with a guy, actually I'll speak to him tomorrow again. He wants to climb Everest. Kilimanjaro was his first mountain with us a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, it was life changing for him. So I think when you challenge yourself physically, it, it, uh, it pushes you mentally. And I think that's where it pushes people into a place where they're like not comfortable and they need to know what that feels like and they need to learn from what that meant. So, yeah, I think there's a mix of people from that are trying to do things and whether it's rowing across the Atlantic or just hiking up Kilimanjaro or 
going up in Glendalough and looking over that hill to see what's up there. I mean, it, it, all of us will lead to something. I think you have people just have to step out and, and do it. And I think the challenge for us in the world that we live in now is that most people live in cities. They don't go out to the hills, although that could be changing after the pandemic, people moving away from cities. But um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting place to go. And I think it really does, like for me, the outdoors and the mental um, stress relieving that it gives you um, is why we ended up here. Um, and I'm a firm believer in manifesting what you believe and then it'll happen to you. So like for years after coming to the States, I was like, I, I'll definitely live in the States one day. And everyone's like, hey, you have no chance. You'll never get a visa. You'll, yeah. <laughs> you'll never be here. And then we're living in a place with, you know, right in the mountains at two and a half thousand meters, which two of the biggest ski resorts in the world with, you know, 4,000 meter peaks uh, around us. I mean, it's, it's, you kind of, you get what you ask for. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm going on and on and on, but the reality is, is that, yeah, there's, there's big learning to be had and the people that are stepping out and doing these things, anyone that steps out and does anything, whether it's a cycle around Wicklow or a hike in somewhere they've never been or traveling outside the country. I mean, that's, you're learning because you gotta, if you're sitting at home thinking about what you can be doing, you're wasting it, you gotta get out and do it. And I know the pandemic is a problem, but when that's over, now is the time to be planning planning for what's ahead and be ready when that when those days come when it's open back up again and it'll be quick i think that would be a great thing now for people to take away from what you said there is plan now you know like i think you hit the nail on the head there with everything you were saying with the like manifesting what you want that kind of stuff um yeah everything you said there really resonated with mm. me and i think another great thing you said earlier on was that you can plan to a certain extent, but you didn't see your life unfold in the way it did. You just said, I'm going to go travel. And then you, you had a background and some climbing. So you're like, I'm going to start climbing some mountains. And then you just kind of led to setting up your trekking company and other things you've done, which hopefully we'll get to talk about soon. But I think that's another important thing. You can plan the first step. That's all you need to know. And you want, sometimes it's good to know the destination, like the, the mountain top. For us, it's we're working with young people, trying to inspire them, empower them to live the lives they want to live. That's like our guiding light. And it can be overwhelming at times to think of all the steps we need to take to get there to our vision. But what I try and say to people is just take one step in the right direction. And even if it's in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter because you'll figure it out and then you can take a step the other way. So I think that's what you did. You just took the step. And I think if people just plan on what first step they're going to take when the time is right, they can do it and then see what goes from there. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say before we move on from that is just, we, we were looking at some of the work you did with mm. in Africa, building, helping build the school, Unbelievable. which is something that myself and Daryl actually yeah. talked about that something we'd love to do someday. And you hear a lot of people saying, I'd love to go to Africa and help or build a school, but not many people actually go and do it. So, we just kind of wanted to maybe hear a little bit about that and what that experience is like for you. And again, what drove you to want to contribute to others in that way? And it was it from that time, that growth you had on the mountains, was it kind of seeing yourself as maybe not the center of the universe? You kind of see yourself as maybe you see other people in a different light or what drove you to want to do that? Um, I think you, you know, there's a few things that are important uh, when I think about where I came from. Um, and uh, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of what I believe, but I do believe that um, you're only fulfilled when you're in a, like helping other people. So you can help yourself to a certain point, but you'll still be sitting there on your own. Um, and I think the human race and, and people in general that want to me, it was about, you know, it's not just about what I'm doing. And I think the mountains did that for me too. You kind of come off and go, well, look, if I go to the top of Everest, nobody really cares. Like it, it's people go, oh, that's cool. You know, most people ask the question, did you get to the top or not? They don't care about the 60 days that it took you to kind of get there or the pain or the suffering or the, the hassle. Um, but what I realized was that people are suffering every day. And I hadn't been, I kind of had been exposed to it, but you, most of the time you turn a blind eye. Um, 
but when we went to Africa, um, you know, we saw the, the reality of how people live. And when I traveled around the world uh, and I kind of came back later, you know, in my early twenties, yeah, I was like, holy crap. I thought Ireland was terrible <laughs> and we had nothing. We had so much, like so much. And most of the people have nothing. I mean, 80% of the world live in well below, you know, the, the level of Ireland. So we're in a far better position than we think we are, although we pay, you pay too many, too much tax and, uh, uh, all, all the other things, but there's some great things too. And uh, what a place to live and what a place to grow up. And, and um, I think the learning in all those experience over time, as you humble yourself, as you become uh, more aware of what's around you, um, I think that, that takes time though. You can't just switch on a light and say, oh, I'm gonna do this or that. You have to be led in a certain way to get there. Um, and for me, it was, yeah, seeing all this stuff and I was like, you know what, we, we can do something here. We can help. Um, and it was kind of the introduction that my family had because my grand aunt, who was 101 when she died in Limerick and my godmother, who's still there and she's 90, um, and my mother and my grandmother and my, my whole family were like making and knitting things and sending their stuff to Africa. And then they, we were introduced, introduced to this guy from Shankill. Trevor Stevenson, who set up this charity called Fields of Life, and now it's expanded to the US and UK and all over the place. Um, and they put like 50,000 children through education um, and they're drilling wells and, you know, putting in vocational colleges and helping people. We were a small part of that. And the Ever School um, was really the kind of, um, it was, the, we realized when we were doing the trip, but we were like, you know what, we have a responsibility because of the privilege that we have of climbing Everest uh, or doing whatever we do in life, we have a, a, a privilege of doing that. And I didn't really understand that at the beginning, but now I have a, a better understanding of, of that. And that we, we are given so much. We, we, although we have to do some of it ourselves and do some of the work, we have so much more than they had and they had the chance like when we went with they went there the kids were like there was hunt there was like well there was 40 kids but tons of people came and now the school has got over 200 children in it but those children were like just and the families and the parents were like you know we need we need a school we need education we need our kids and they were like saying this to us and we're just like holy crap these people are like they want this to happen so badly and i'll say something else about the school in a minute but that's what kind of drove us. We're like, and we, when we filmed all this, because we filmed a documentary on it, um, we were sitting there thinking about it. No, no matter what we do, we have to come back and build a school. So whatever about climbing Everest or the mountains or whatever, we got to build a school uh, because that made more of an impact on us than anything that we had seen. Um, and that was kind of what we did when we came home. We did everything we possibly could to raise that 70,000 euro at the time. Um, and then the school went up and you know, 10 years later, it was like teacher's accommodation, there's water. They had to walk miles to get water. Now they got water right there. Somebody donated land for a football field. So every time we go there, we're playing so you know, football with the kids. Um, you know, it's, it's, but I, I, it's not even about us. And, and I, I don't really talk, we, we talk about it in the trekking business just because it, we want people to sponsor kids and we want pe those children to have a chance um, and we want to inspire other people to maybe do it. And we have, like we built our second school in Nepal now. So we have two schools in Nepal and we, after the earthquake and I was there when that happened, um, that kind of inspired a whole other um, section of what we do. Um, but it was all about that. It was just like education, even though I wasn't that good at it, was the key, it was like at least open some doors mm. Um, and we had those opportunities um, and it was about just taking them. And those kids wanted that. Like, I didn't care about school. I was like, how quickly can I get out of it? These people were trying to get in there to like give themselves a chance. So it, it was quite unique um, experience to go through. And, and it continues now. It, it has evolved into, I sit on the board as the president of the board in the US, just making sure that there's accountability in terms of funds. Um, and I try and encourage people to to sponsor children at the Mount Everest School. And if anyone wants to get involved in that way, that's that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, it's 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 more about um, stepping out there and seeing like you you see a need, 
And then if you're affected by it, then you do something about it. That's ultimately how it happens. Because you can watch all the TV ads of starving kids in Africa. It really doesn't make an impact anymore. You have to get out there and see something um, or whatever it is that people believe in. You have to then start looking at how can you help. But I think that's a process. You, I, I mean, it's not something you get into straight away and you have to be passionate about it and you have to know you have to go and see i think to believe a lot of the time and um, so going out and experiencing these places definitely i'm reminded of the time we went there in 2007 and then 2009 and 2013 to film again um yeah you kind of like see the growth too like i remember seeing kids that were like bloated because of like poor nutrition and then you come back to the school like six years later and kids have uniforms on they even changed their logo and their motto for the school. Um, I mean, just incredible to see it. And the, the, the want for that. I mean, that's, that's just powerful. And we, we've like, to be honest, we play, I play a very small part in all that, but it, the message I suppose about it is that we can make an impact with the right people around us and, and, and finding organizations that are doing good work with good, you know, our guys have like 90% admin, it goes to the projects and 10% admin. Mm. Like you you buy into stuff like that and you see the work that's happening and then you can kind of take it to the next level. Um, but I think you have to see it to kind of really figure out what it is that you want to help with. And I think you have to be in a position to do it too. Um, like my, when I got married, I was, I'm 42 now, but I was 30 at the time. I mean, my mother-in-law was like, you know, get your, get your shit together, like get it together because you know what, you, you don't have anything. I was living with my parents in Leakslip. I was in debt. I had no money. And I don't know how my wife like was into it, but I don't know why you would take on that much hassle. So I, I was not in a good position financially at the time, but I, it came back to me. And I'm a big believer in that when you step out and you help someone else or help other people, it comes back to you like tenfold And the next 10 years of my life completely transformed um from stepping out and helping someone else um and that is the guiding light for me when i think about everything that i do like we've staff in africa now we've staff in nepal we've staff in peru uh we're giving them a cut of our business so that they can be successful we've helped our staff buy land set up businesses set up safari businesses set up uh, grocery stores mm. like you there's so many things that are possible um only when we give back and, and that was kind of the big learning for me about stepping into an environment of serving and helping, um, even in a small way, um, it comes back to you 10 times. Yeah. What I was going to ask you there was, um, for people that can't, say, get to see these places, is there a way for them to help back what you do, like back your kind of project? Is there a way for people that can't see to get there at the moment to help out as well? Yeah, I mean, oh, I mean, if anyone wants to get it's I mean, there's so many avenues for fundraising. Uh, I think I think personally to, for people to really help is yeah. to pick a specific project. So mm -hmm. like whether it's a, a well in a town somewhere that gives, you know, 500 people clean water, you know, those projects are like five thousand uh, dollars. I mean, that's a, an interesting way to go. OK, I can really go out now and say I'm drilling a well in Uganda. It's going to be five thousand dollars. I mean, people are doing crazy stuff online now with GoFundMe and uh, projects. We did uh, somebody, in, a friend of ours in Selbridge, his daughter went out and started climbing, hiking some mountains pre pre pandemic, and raised enough money for like uh, I think with a little bit of help a, a well. I mean, it's incredible. You can go out and do these things. People can sponsor a child. I mean, it's only twenty something dollars a month or twenty euro a month. Um, and they get a meal a day, they get fed, they get their uniform, they get taught. I mean, it's quite incredible uh, for a small amount of money that can make a massive amount of difference. Yeah. At the Ever School, I mean, there's so many projects, there's fencing, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a whole lot of things that people could take ownership of. Um, but yeah, I think even sponsoring another child and tracking that child and talking to them and, and um, yeah experiencing that i wish i'd have done that when i was younger because then i'd have this this connection with somewhere else um which maybe would open doors for me to eventually have gone there sooner uh, and maybe had more of an impact uh when i was younger but uh you can always look back and 
and, and say he could change things. But yeah, yeah I mean, feels feels a life for bait. I mean, started in Dublin, and now is you know has affected people all over the world. So um, an inspiring story. We got tons of videos on our YouTube channel on our. Um, and I can put people in touch with them if they're if they're interested in, in getting involved with the Ever School or just the organization in Uganda um, or even in Nepal and going out hiking and going out to a remote village when the time is right. Um, but even raising like two hundred dollars or two hundred euro can bring in like two stoves to two homes where kids are living in like their people are cooking inside these like wooden shacks mm. and the, the smoke is just bellowing inside the house. and it's you know we're doing so we have a stove project in Nepal where we're putting stoves in homes so kids don't have to be breathing all that filth into them um and that's a cheap you know 100 euro boom you've 200 right. euro you put in two homes a thousand euro there's 10 homes um those are like simple things that people go wait and go you know what i'm going to do something for those kids in Nepal um because it's one you know it's one of the it's the fourth poorest country in the world so yeah. there's tons of projects uh but I think people have to f find some affiliation to it. Um, yeah, if anyone's interested, they can ask me and I'll put them in the right direction. They could contact you on Ian Taylor. Trekking. Yeah, just Ian at iantaylortrekking.com or go to our website, Ian, uh, iantaylortrekking.com. Happy to steer people in those in any direction. With it. Cool. Um, I really appreciate that, Ian, because I think for me as well, I did a bit of my own work with and people experiencing homelessness in Dublin a few years back. And it was kind of, um, I think it's important to get some sort of connection to it, but also remember that you don't have to necessarily go to other countries and stuff to help. You can just help at home, like even your family, like bring it back to your family and like who's struggling in my own family and stuff like that. Like it's important to help abroad as well, but like you don't always have to look that far. Sometimes there could be someone in your family that just needs you to listen to them. I could be struggling and um, like even Daryl a few years ago was struggling with his stuff and I kind of maybe was so focused on the homelessness in Dublin that I wasn't even seeing my own brother who probably I forgive you for that yeah <laughs> but you know so I, I think it's don't get lost for other people not to get lost in like we'll have to climb Everest or I have to go help build a school like they're amazing things but people at the moment they can do small things which are just as important because there's people in your life yeah. that maybe need that bit of help and there's small things you can do as well bringing it back to challenging yourself every day like whether it's having a cold shower or going for a 5k run like i'm only doing 5ks at the minute but that's for me getting back into running that's a challenge for me that pushes me and it's compared to everest obviously it's nothing but <laughs> you have to start somewhere so i want to remind people of that as well i think that's important of course all the small challenges yeah there's the same small challenges every day is what brings you to your Everest, if you know yes. what I mean, you know? Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. And Ian, just before we let you go, we just had a, a few questions we wanted to ask you um, just at the end. So the first one was, is there any book that kind of changed your life or changed your way of seeing things? Um, and any quote that you like to keep in mind? Yeah, I, I think about, I mean, there's two things. Uh, when it comes to mountaineering, uh, there's a famous American guy called Ed Vesters who's written tons of books and has, I think, the first American to do all the 14, uh, four, 14 peaks above 8,000 meters without oxygen. And his, his message to me even before I went to Everest and beforehand was always about, uh, you know, getting to the top is optional, uh, but getting down uh, and getting out um, is mandatory. So... I mean, I feel like that was a big lesson for me and everything. Uh, you know, you, you don't always have to get to the top to be successful or you don't, you have to get down though, because if you don't get down and you have good things to do and share and be a part of, you got to come down. You got to, you got to, you know, you got to come home. Don't get lost um, up in the clouds. <laughs> don't get lost up there and, and stay up there. You got to come back down. Yeah. That's, I mean, you can think about that. Anyone that's listening can think about that in a range of different ways. But for me, that was really important uh, to keep my focus on on that when I was in these intense and hard experiences. That this is not the like the most important thing. Coming down is. I think the when I mentioned about the school, the school um, changed their logo 
uh, when we built it in 2008 or in 2009, we went to visit the school and they had a new uniform. We had a new logo. And then the logo, they put in the logo and it said, today's actions brings tomorrow's success. Mm. And I was blown away by that. A bunch of people like, oh, like two hours in the middle of nowhere, mm. outside of Kampala, like way out in the middle of nowhere, coming up with that sort of vision uh, for their town and for their school and for their kids that today everything they do today brings tomorrow success i'll never forget it um it i use it in all my kind of everest presentations that i give around the states and around the place um it still blows my mind to think that those people had that sort of attitude towards everything uh, that today's actions brings tomorrow success so that's not in any book anywhere but um yeah, that was from that was from a bunch of kids well, that one i said <laughs> so, so that yeah. actually brings me on to the next question. Um, what's your definition of success? I think I think success is when you're in. To me, it's about when you're in the position to help other people. Mm. That that's the definition of success to me. So when you you know when you find yourself in a place where you're actually able to help other people, to me that's success right there. Um, and nothing can give you that other than experience and life experience and stepping out of your comfort zone. Um, so yeah, being in a, for me, being in a place to help other people is, is success. Cool. And one more day. the last one, what's well, the second last one, actually, what advice would you give to your teenage self back then when you said you were lost and back when you were in school there and there was teachers maybe not saying the nicest things and what advice would you give to that person? You have to believe in yourself no matter what it takes. So um, no, ma no matter what anyone said to me, um, yeah, I was shaken and stirred. Um, but if I was looking, if I was telling myself, then I, I, I wish somebody had said to me, you, you have what it takes. Um, you can do anything you want. Um, yeah, I wish I wish somebody I, that if I was talking to myself now, that's what I would say. So you, you have what it takes. Get out there and do it. Don't don't listen to everybody. Just get after it. That's a, I think that's that's a, a brilliant one. Yeah. there Because there's so Good many message. people kind of telling us what you mm -hmm. should do and what you shouldn't do. And you just have to listen to yourself and decide you can do whatever you want. The last question, which is probably the most important. Um, are you a tea drinker? And if so, is it Lions or Barry's? Oh my God. You know what? Living in the States, all you can get is Barry's tea, I'm afraid. It's not terrible because like we, I grew up during, I mean, go home to my parents' house, it's Lion's tea. Yeah. I, haven't been, I haven't been in Ireland since uh, July, 2019. So I, oh, really? you know, because I, haven't, I haven't been able to get back uh, home. So normally when I'm back there, I'm picking up. Uh, we'll, we'll send you a box. <laughs> I'm we'll send you a box of kilt, here today. I'm taking chronic guilty sausages, putting it in a bag, putting it in my bag, and trying yeah. to squeeze through customs in the US. Yeah. But and throw in some Kerrygold butter as well. So. Uh, we can get that here now, so oh, yeah. we're good with that. Yeah. <laughs> but lion's tea, I think, is what we grew up on. Yeah, uh, we can tell. Um, well, <laughs> thanks very much, Ian, for taking the time to chat mm. to us. And it was really enjoyable. Yeah. I learned a lot as well myself. And it's very humbling to hear your story of, yeah. and all you've done. And you obviously. And what you've given back as well. So um appreciate yeah, you taking thanks the time. very much for coming on. That was for me, that was inspirational for me to listen to. Yeah. And you know, so yeah, we're look I looked at some of the videos on the website and they're amazing as well. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone wants to check you out just once more, it's Ian Taylor Trekking. Ian Taylor Trekking dot com. Yeah. And I mean, happy to chat to anyone. And I mean what you guys are doing is all all we're all doing is making trying to make a small difference. So yeah. Yeah, what you guys are doing is amazing. Keep it up. Uh, any anything you need in terms of sharing stuff or any support, I, I know some media contacts in Ireland. So if you do need uh, <laughs> any contacts, do let me know. And uh, good luck with all the work you're doing. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Thanks very much. Chat to you later. Yeah. Thank you. All right. See you soon.